Okay, well, we're going to be diving in on page 10 in the notebooks tonight. So if you want to um, turn there. And we are going to have um, several segments through the course of this class that we call uh, Great Bible Themes. And these are matters that uh, have to be addressed really by any religion. Um, you know, things like what we're going to be looking at tonight, for instance, who is God? Well, any religion has to, has to manage that question. And um, so we're going to be talking about what the Bible says about the God of the Bible. Um, uh, and then the, uh, the other great themes that we're going to be looking at in, in future weeks will be similar kinds of things. The, the sort of material that basically any religion needs to, uh, needs to address. Um, besides just, you know, kind of usual sort of topics for religion, uh, we also are focusing, and the reason we're calling them great themes is because these are things that are not just mentioned once or twice. These are um, topics that permeate the Bible end to end uh, that come up over and over again. And this is a class about how do I get started with effective reading, really getting something out of what I'm reading. And so having a little bit of an idea of what these great themes are that run through the Bible, we think will be helpful. So as you dive in, um, instead of finding it daunting, we hope that you will find it like, oh, I remember they said something about that. You know, here's promise, and we had a great theme on promises, and here's something about the nature of God, and, here, and we had something on that. Um, and, you know, you'll be able to tie some things together. So that's the reason that we're, that we're doing all so, so, who's God and what is he like? Um, we're going to start with a consideration of the names and titles, at least some of them, that are applied to the God of the Bible. Um, and the first one, uh, you remember from our um, introduction last week on the structure of the Bible, that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, the New Testament in Greek. So the Old Testament names of God are Hebrew names. And these, uh, we're going to start with this family of three uh, names that are all related to each other. You can even see uh, that, they're, that they're related. By the way, just in case you don't know, Hebrew reads right to left. So these words all read this way. The English transcription reads this way, okay? So you can see that the first letters are the same, right? Um, and, you know, going this way. So it's, it's El and Eloah and Elohim, this family of words. Uh, literally, they mean mighty. And the word Elohim is actually Hebrew plural. I am on the end means that it's a plural noun in Hebrew. And so this one would literally be rendered mighty ones, but there's... Uh, Ancient Hebrew had no uh, way to capitalize or underline or, you know, things like that. So what ancient Hebrew does for emphasis is it turns a singular into a plural. The verbs stay singular, but the noun is turned to a plural for emphasis. So this is like how you capitalize something, you know, in, in ancient Hebrew, um, how, you, how you draw attention to it. Um, so, uh, this, this family of words means mighty. Um, it is usually translated God, uh, which could be uh, capital G or lowercase g, uh, sort of God. And it is sometimes applied to angels, and it is occasionally applied to human beings, uh, uh, human rulers. So it means mighty. A human ruler might be a mighty man, right? So the, the term actually occasionally is, is applied to human rulers. Um, the second name is the Hebrew name Shaddai, which literally means powerful. And it's usually translated almighty in our English uh, translations. The next one is, uh, has the most that needs to be said about it. This is 
sometimes called the Tetragrammaton. I don't think that's actually in your notebook anywhere. If you want to write it down, it's Tetra, T-E-T-R-A, Grammaton, G-R-A-M-M-A-T-O-N, which means, it's a fancy word that means four letters. <laughs> because, because that's what it is. This name of God, Y-H-W-H, which is sometimes rendered Jehovah or Yehovah or Yahweh or Yava. Um, it's, we, we don't actually know how it should be pronounced because um, there, you maybe uh, will remember that one of the Ten Commandments was you, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And so the Jews were concerned that they might accidentally do that, and so they would not say his name. Um, and when they were reading out loud, they would actually substitute the next word we're going to look at, which is Adonai. They would substitute that, um, which is the word for Lord. And so in our English translations, because of that Jewish superstition, basically, renders this Lord. And you know what? Every time I've changed this slide to make the make it be in small capitals, it has changed it back on me. So I apologize. So it's probably going to be all the way through here. All Every slide that has Lord on it in caps is supposed to have small caps, and it looks like they aren't going <laughs> to. So sorry about that. So, But when you see Lord in all caps, and they, it will typically be, the ORD will be in smaller size caps, that's a rendering of the Hebrew tetragrammaton, the, the Yehovah, or Yahweh. And the, it is it's just a uh, carrying on of the Jewish tradition of, of doing that. Okay, so the, now there are a couple of translations, a couple of good English translations. We're going to talk about texts and translations in a future week. Um, but there's two of them that actually use the, the, the name. Because this is the name. This is what God calls the memorial name, the name by which he wishes to be remembered. It's very ironic that we can't remember how to pronounce it anymore. Because it's the name by which he wanted to be remembered. Um, but two translations, the Holman Christian Standard Bible uses Yahweh. And the Jerusalem Bible uses Yahweh. Um, but though most English translations will have Lord in all caps. There is a short form of this name also that's just the two letters, just Y-H, and it's, it's, it we actually know how to pronounce. It's pronounced Yah, and the reason we know how to pronounce it is because it's on the tail end of a whole lot of Hebrew names. You ever heard of Jeremiah, Isaiah, Micah, actually Micaiah, that all of those end in, it's an I-A in our English translations, but it's, it's the name Yah. It's God's name is in their name. Um, as we're going to look in a, uh, a little bit later, um, Yahshua, Joshua, is another one. Um, and that is the, uh, the sneak preview, uh, that is the person that Jesus was named after. So, uh, the, you know, the, that name is in Hebrew names, and so we actually know how to pronounce Yah, the first part of, of that name. Uh, the last Hebrew uh, name that we'll look at is Adon. Um, there's another form of it that sometimes comes up, Adonai. It's got an A-I on the end of the A-D-O-N. Um, this means sovereign. It's usually translated Lord, and you'll notice that it's lowercase, right? So in the English translation, it's all, well, capital L, and then lowercase O-R-D. That's a translation of Adon, or Adonai, whereas Lord with all caps is a translation of the, the divine name, Yahweh. Um, this one is definitely used of men a lot of times. It just means Lord, a, a person who is a sovereign. So uh, any king, any noble person, you know, a person of 
significantly higher social rank is approach, you know, is, is called work. Okay, shifting to the New Testament, now we're moving to Greek. Greek goes left to right just like English. <laughs> so, um, the, the same direction we're used to. So the first one is uh, theos, which means deity. It's usually translated, once again, God, uh, big G or little g. Um, it is um, also used to translate Elohim from the New Testament. So in when New Testament writers quote the Old Testament, of course, they're putting it in Greek, um, so they, it has to be translated. Usually they're, they're uh, quoting from a, a Greek translation of the Old Testament. And uh, where Elohim comes up in the Old Testament, Hebrew text, then you'll find theos in the Greek of the New Testament. Just like Elohim in the Old Testament, it is very occasionally applied to men. Um, typically, however, it's applied to God. And the last one we're going to look at, the second one from the New Testament, is kurios. This one means supreme. It's usually translated lord or master um, in the sense of master of a slave, master of a servant. Um, it's used uh, to translate Yahweh and also used to translate Adon, um, and it's also used of men. So just like Adon in Hebrew, it's you know anyone who is a uh, in a higher social rank would be addressed as Lord, and this would be the word that they would use. Yes. Well, why is Hebrews in the Greek half and not the Hebrew half? Well, it's addressed to Hebrew addressed to Jews, to the Jewish believers in Jerusalem. Okay. But it's in the New Testament, so it's written in Greek. Right. So in our Books of the Bible segments, which we'll do every week, we will get to that in the final week. Right. <laughs> so. Well, everything we've talked about so far is a little bit on the technical side. So, But the, the fact is that God has these names and titles, and they mean something, right? What does the word God mean? Well, do you even know that the English word God is derived from good? Or actually, it's the other way around. The word good is derived from, from you know, it's, it's, it's Gott in German. Um, gut. Gut is good. Gott is God in German. So you can hear this how related they are, right? God and good, you can hear how related those are in English. Um, but, you know, really, we don't think about it. We use God as like it was a name, but it's not. It's a title. Um, and his name is actually Yahweh, and that's the one thing that you won't find in most English translations. <laughs> so, you know, we felt like it was worth spending a little bit of time on this technical stuff. We learn a little bit about him how God reveals himself, right? He's mighty, he's powerful. He is, oh, you know what? I think I failed to mention something important. Let's go back on the, um, oh, the, the literal meaning of, of this is um, drawn from Exodus 3, where God says, I am. So it's usually considered that, that the, um, the meaning of this name is I am or I will be. Uh, maybe future tense as well. So as we talked about, well, we might as well go back a little bit. So, so God is um, mighty, right? And he is powerful. And he is. And he will be. He is the sovereign, the king, the Lord. He is deity. He is supreme. Right? So all of these things, these names tell us something about God. They aren't just empty sounds. But I think it'll be even more helpful if we actually look at what the Bible text says about this God who carries these names and titles. And um, so we're going to look at the characteristics. And the first one is a really big one. A big deal is made of this. And that is that there was one God. 
And uh, this passage uh, from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6, verse 4, uh, which is also quoted by Jesus and Mark. Um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And as I suspected, it once again changed all my small caps to big caps. I don't know what's going on. Um, so, God is, there is one God, and also he is a unity. The, the Lord is one. Did you have your hand up there? That was my question. I said, could it also be his unity? Yes. Which Absolutely. would mean he's not self-contradictory, right? Right. Right. So he is one. Okay. His, his being is that he is one. And, and not, not dispersed and... Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. So he is a unity. Um, and, and as far as there not being any other gods besides him, um, the next uh, passage uh, from Isaiah 44, verse 6, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. So couldn't ask for it stated plainer than that. Same thought in the New Testament. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2.5. Um, so Old and New Testaments, and this is, like we said, this is one of those great things. You will see this over and over again as you read uh, God's declaration of his unity or, or it being implied. Uh, the next sort of fact about God uh, that he that claims in this book is that he created everything. So we looked last week at Genesis 1.1 where it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Um, from a speech uh, made by the Apostle Paul in Acts 17, um, Paul writes or says, uh, the God who made the world and everything in it, so he makes the same claim from Genesis 1.1, being Lord of heaven and earth does not live in temples made by man nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. So he is the provider as well as the creator. Um, the next thing that is claimed about God um, in the Bible, he is eternal. So from Psalm 90, verse 2, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So infinite into the past, infinite into the future. Um, you know, eternal and immortal. And then from the uh, New Testament, 1 Timothy uh, 6, uh, excerpting a little bit from, the, from these verses that are shown there. Uh, God, who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality. Then there's um, the, the next characteristics we're going to look at. Are, there's three omnis. You may have heard of these. He is omnipotent, uh, omniscient, omnipresent. We're going to, to look at those uh, three claims. So he is all-powerful. He is omnipotent. Um, and Job says in uh, addressing God, Job 42.2, I know that you can do all things, that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Well, that means he's more, well, he's all powerful. He can't, there isn't any such thing as a purpose of his that can be thwarted. That's what it's claimed. And then um, the uh, angel says to Mary, uh, nothing will be impossible with God. That's something you can't say about any of us. The um, everywhere present, the omnipresent, um, Psalm 139, verses 7 to 10. Um, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, that's the grave, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. So you can't, there isn't anywhere you can go where he isn't. And finally, the omniscience, the all-knowing aspect, this one from Hebrews, uh, chapter 4, verse 13 in the New Testament. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him 
to whom we must give account. So he, he sees all. Um, another big deal that is made over and over in the Bible, and, and this begins to get down to how this all impacts ourselves, and that is God's relationship to mankind. So he is um, said to be merciful and forgiving, uh, but he does hold people accountable. We have responsibilities to God. So this is what God himself says to Moses in Exodus 34 when uh, Moses asks to see God's glory and God proclaims his name. He says, The Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. I mean, phrase after phrase after phrase piled up about how merciful, forgiving, all of this he is. But who will by no means clear the guilty. And that this same two points, the same kind of two sides are really emphasized in the New Testament um, in Romans chapter 11, verses 22 to 23. Um, note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you provided that you continue in his kindness. So, so there's, uh, there's conditions attached here, right? Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. So this, you know, even people who are cut off can be brought back. That's the mercy of God. But he does hold people accountable. So if they rebel against him, if they refuse him, then, you know, the, then there is the severity. Um, the New Testament uh, tells us that God, God's person, his own being, is the very definition of love. A uh, pretty uh, well-known verse, 1 John 4, 8, anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. So his own person becomes the definition for, for love. And the Psalms and, and elsewhere, but particularly in Psalm 103, um, God is depicted as a patient and compassionate father. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide nor will he keep his anger forever. I should have mentioned that that first sentence there, that's a direct quote out of Exodus 34 that we looked at a minute ago. So then, so then David goes on to comment, he will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. So this very patient, very compassionate father uh, that is depicted here. Uh, something else that is kind of a big deal uh, about the, God's relationship to mankind is that he is involved with mankind. He is not a distant, uncaring God. He is closely involved. Uh, from the Old Testament, Isaiah 57, verse 15. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. You know, he's, he's really high. He's far away. I dwell in the high and holy place. And also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit. To revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. So he is exalted, but he also, you know, he lives above the heavens but he also lives with those who are humble. And a very similar point that uh, the Apostle Paul makes in that speech in Acts 17, going back to, uh, to that chapter, different verses, he, Paul says, they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. So this is a long, long way from the kind of stereotypical view uh, that the God of the Bible is, uh, 
is stern and is judgmental and is uh, mostly about punishing, uh, uh, that he's vengeful, that he must be appeased. Those are pictures of God that are held by a lot of people, but they're not the Bible, the God of the Bible. Now, there are the two aspects, right? There's the goodness and the severity. And when his severity is ex exercised, I think that's what gives rise to people concluding that this God is, you know, this vengeful, wrathful God. Um, but that is not the way he chooses to depict himself. He depicts himself, I, I think, when he declares his own name to Moses, the balance can be seen phrase after phrase after phrase about how he's merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast loving, keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving and all of that and then, but he won't clear the guilt. So, you know, just the, the number of phrases that describe his mercy and um, uh, forbearing and then one phrase that tells us there's another side and this will come into play if it must, if we do not avail ourselves of the, uh, the merciful characteristic. In other words, he said Sorry. it's really important that you obey and, yeah. and, and, and uh, yeah, he I, says I mean I, it. I, 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 I have mean a this. really important <laughs> mission and I want you to develop and, and be holy as, and I'll help you. Right. Right. And, but if you refuse you, you may think it's not important, but it, yeah. it is important, therefore I, I, I have to scare you into it if necessary. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, well, you know, I mean, there are consequences, and we're supposed to understand those consequences. Yeah, natural you know, right. consequences, yes. too. That's, That's right. right. So, so we're, yeah. uh, anytime we uh, have a, a thought, uh, let's see. A thought in our mind or say something to someone that we shouldn't be said then um, I'm separated from God but if I ask him his forgiveness then I'm back with him exactly so it's a continuous well that the, the point is because we're human and we're sinners we have to all day long be saying Lord, forgive me for saying that. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we, we, we have to, and you know, who, who does God say he lives with? The people with the contrite hearts, right? And that's what you're describing, yeah. right? Being contrite in heart. Now, I think it's possible for us to express our contrition maybe for, that covers, <laughs> you know, a, a lot of failings. You know, we, you know, we realize, man, I was... I was terrible today, you know, and approach, approach God for, for forgiveness at that time. We're actually going to have a whole section on sin and redemption um, later on in, the, in this course of classes, because that's another one of the great themes, right? So we'll, we'll see if, you, if we kind of hit uh, your question in that yeah. in more detail. In so, this class? Mm -hmm. It'll actually be, I think, in the fifth week. So, so then, <clears throat> those of us who have accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, uh, I think, are we not I, in a different... I think where are you going with that? We, we, let's wait okay. and, 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 right. and take, gotcha. Gotcha. tackle this when we've got the time to okay. really do it right. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Because I think I understand where you're going with it, and we're gonna we're gonna talk more okay. about okay. it. Okay. Okay. So, but right now it's time for Ray to do his next section. Okay. We are on page 13 in the notebook. Jewish history. So here's my question for you. When you open the Bible and you start reading something, do you sometimes say, "What's going on here"? You know, what's what's happening here? Well, that's what we're gonna, I'm gonna try in this section to give you just a broad overview of Jewish history so you know if you pick up and read something in Psalms or Isaiah or Matthew or wherever that you have some general idea 
I mean, we could spend hours on this subject alone, but we're going to do, my, my notes say Old Testament history in about 90 seconds. <laughs> I tried to do it in 90 seconds, and my, I can't do it. So maybe 92, 93, or maybe a little bit longer, but you know, we're going to go through pretty quickly. But the question really is, first off, why are we even spending time on this? Why are we spending time on Jewish history? You know, the, we're, we're taught, this is a class about the Christian Bible, right? Well, so it might seem a little strange, but we saw last week that the scriptures of Judaism, or of the Jews, actually from the Old Testament, is, they, they form the Old Testament of the Christian Bible. So it's important to understand Jewish history. In the Old Testament, that's what it does. It records ancient Jewish history. In the New, Jesus was a Jew. Christianity got its start in Judaism. And so it's, it's important to understand that. And the Bible says that the history of Israel, Jewish history, is not done. The history of Israel is not done. There are prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled that talk about Israel's future. So again, that's sort of the why. Why are we looking at this? Um, last week we talked about that Israel was the name that God gave to Jacob. And we've got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Jacob, the son, son of Isaac, son, grandson of, of Abraham. And Jacob's sons, those three, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob's sons are actually called the patriarchs, or the fathers of the, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. The Bible tells us that, the, the, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were so faithful that God promised that through their families, the blessing would come to all mankind. So the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Later this evening, we're going to talk, as we, as we go on through overviews of the books of the Bible, we're going to talk about how this small tribal group, starting with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, emerged as the nation of Israel. So we'll, we'll get into that in a, in a little while later this evening. But what I want to do right now is just to really give a brief overview of the, this people's whole history. Just so you, again, can fit it all into the context of, of where they are and fit material in where it belongs in that history. In your notebooks, um, past the, I think it's the first blue divider, or second blue divider, first, first one, there is a timeline. Um, it is, it's Bible chronology sort of turned sideways there. So you might want to keep your finger there, but also keep your finger back starting on page 13. So if you need to flip back and forth, you can certainly do that. Or, or pull the timeline. Yeah, pull out the rings if you want. Yeah, just open the rings. So what, what page is Where's the that? timeline? The timeline, it doesn't have a page. It comes after Roman numeral 6. So it would be technically Roman numeral 7. Does everybody see it there? Yeah, find that so you have that handy. Keep going, Alec. It's past the, past the first blue divider. Oh. Oh, yeah. Everybody got it? Yeah. You'll find it. No, find it. Yeah, we hit on that last. You find table. it back there. Oh. There's only one. Oh, there. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll, we need to fill it out back later. Larry, you got it. Yep, got it. I remember now that I see it. I remember okay. it from last week. Okay. Okay, we're in good shape. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. Ninety seconds of Jewish history. A little, bit, a little bit longer. Uh, first off, we've got God choosing Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for their faith. In your notebook on page 13, there's actually a little bit more information. There's the references. You know, it says in the notebook, Genesis 12 through 35, approximately 1800 BC. So you'll, you'll see a little bit more detail than we're going to show up on the screen tonight. Um, but God chooses Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God makes promises to them and a designation of Abraham's family to begin with as the chosen people. So this is where we start. God promises to work through them, like I said earlier, for the good of all mankind. So that's, that's, that's very important to have a good foundation and understanding of the promises 
to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We just finished a couple weeks ago, finished a, a study of Genesis that lasted about two years. So that's how important I think Genesis is and the foundation to Scripture. So it's important to understand that. Um, after that, we've got uh, the family all moves to Egypt. And in, in Genesis, Genesis 37 through 50, is the story of Joseph, um, Jacob, one of Jacob's sons, and how the Jewish people, the Israelites, got to Egypt. Um, I'm trying to keep up with a couple different things here. Once the family migrates to Egypt, they actually emerge from Egypt 400 years later as a nation. So, and while they are emerging, that's when the, the law of Moses is given. Um, you'll see here up on the screen, when they, they leave Egypt, they actually wander in the wilderness for 40 years after the, so they've been in Egypt, the, the Passover happens, then the Exodus, which most people know those stories, um, law of Moses given at Mount Sinai, and then 40 years wandering in the wilderness, and then finally, they enter the promised land. And they enter the promised land under the, the, the rulership or guidance of Joshua. So when you hear about the book of Joshua, this is what part of that story is, is about. I have heard that uh, the reason why they went to Egypt was because uh, they had there were no crops and they, they yes. were starving. That's exactly, mm -hmm. and that's in and that's in Genesis 37 through 50. It tells about all that. Mm -hmm. but that's exactly right. I mean. Make a real long story short, yeah. Joseph gets sold into slavery by his yes. brothers because his brothers hated yeah. him. Yes. And he ends up being second in command of Pharaoh. Pharaoh yes. has a dream, talks about the, the, the good years, seven good years, and then the seven years of famine. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And then during that seven years of famine, his brothers have to go down to Egypt to get food. Right. And then they, they come a second time, and then Joseph reveals who he is, and then says, bring everybody, bring the whole family bring down whole here. Family. Yeah. They're there then for 400 years. So. Yeah. That's, that was that was about six weeks of Bible class yeah. there in, in thirty <laughs> seconds. seconds. Yeah, but uh, you're right. So you, you heard right and you understood right. So that's that's how they got there. Okay. Um, okay. So they go in the Promised Land. They're ruled by judges. So they're ruled by judges, and the period of the judges is covered in the book of Judges and Ruth. And you'll see in your notebook it says that's around fourteen fifty to ten fifty B.C. So that's number, on page 13, number 5 is, is where we are there. Um, after that, there's what's called a united monarchy, a king, kingdom, under Saul, David, and Solomon. So you've got Saul, who's the first king of Israel. Then you've got David. We've heard stories of David and Goliath and all that. Well, there's, that's David who becomes the king, and then his son Solomon. So this is where we are in, in history. And... That's re recorded in 1 and 2 Samuel and part of 1 Kings also. And again, you'll see in your notebook, somewhere around the time of 1050 to 930 B.C. After that, this kingdom, which was united, is divided. It's divided into the northern kingdom, which keeps the name Israel, and then the southern kingdom, which is named, called Judah. Okay, so I always have a problem remembering which one's which, and I just think, okay, it's alphabetical. Israel north, Judah south. And then we're going to see in a moment here, exile of the north, Israel to Assyria, and exile of the south, Babylonia. Again, in my simple mind, I just say it's alphabetical. You know, Israel, Judah, Assyria, Babylonia. So that's, from, that's the way I've pegged it in my memory for all these years, and I still forget half the time. <laughs> But this is this is what's happening in the land of uh, in the land of what is known today as Israel. Um, and just for a, a quick note, on, you can see over here, the land of Israel as we know it today, Assyria over in this area, Babylonia over in this area. So this is modern day Iraq. What's modern? Almost all Iraq. Iraq. Yeah, okay. I'm not good at my geography, but I know that at least. So it gives you an idea of, of where things where things are. Um, under this this exile or the exile of the north to Syria, if you look in your notebook, under item seven and eight. Yeah. So seven is where it starts. It talks about the exile of the northern kingdom to Assyria, which is talked about in Second Kings. 
But then the exile in the southern kingdom to Babylon, actually it happens in three stages. <clears throat> and Jerusalem is destroyed. Solomon's temple. Solomon had, had I mean, Solomon was one of the kings. The, you know, Saul, David, and Solomon. Solomon had built a temple. But that temple is destroyed during this sta these stages of the exile. You've read about the prophet Daniel, heard about the prophet Daniel, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah. This is all during their time frame. Um, and then there's, for the southern kingdom, 70 years in exile. At the end of that, again, southern kingdom, Judah, gone to Babylon, Babylonia. But then at the end of 70 years, there's a return, from Ju a return of Judah from the captivity. When they return, that is, not quite there yet, that is, again, point nine on your, in your notebook, when the second temple is built, Ezra and Nehemiah are returning from captivity. The walls of Jerusalem are rebuilt. And then eventually we have the, the completion of the Old Testament. So that's the end of the story, at least Old Testament-wise. After that, we have the beginning of the New Testament. Between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, 400 years. So 400 year gap. So when you turn that one page in your Bible, there's 400 years of history that you're turning mm -hmm. right there. So and that's just, just good to keep in mind that there is, there is stuff going on. There's history there, but it's not recorded in Scripture. Um, during the time of the New Testament, you've got the Greeks. So the Greeks come in and conquer the Israelites. So the Greeks are coming in, and you can see again point 10 on page 13, three, around 330 B.C., somewhere in that, that point of time. During this history, this 400 years, you've got the period of the Maccabees, and they're semi-autonomous. They're not necessarily completely ruled by the Greeks, but you've got a period of the Maccabees. But then in 63 B.C., you have the Romans that conquer the, the, the land. And the Romans are there when Jesus arrives on the scene. During the time also, the, the synagogue system is developed. Okay, So you read throughout the New Testament about them going into synagogues. This is the time where that, that whole system is, is developed. So, early Christian era. This is when we start the stories of Jesus. New Testament begins. We've got John the Baptist announces the Messiah has arrived. Okay, let me get on the same page you all are here in your notebook. So, we've got the Gospels, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then we go on into the Acts. Approximately 4 BC to 70 AD is, is the New Testament is written. Jesus of Nazareth preaches for three and a half years, thereabouts. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you think about it, I think about it, and I think about the whole course of human history and the importance of Jesus. It's just this little bitty sliver of time of three and a half years. It's really, really incredible. And when you look at all of history, is well, we're not. I'm looking at all of it, but all of Jewish history. There's a little slow sliver of time when Jesus appears and changes the world. Changes the world. We're sitting here tonight because it's a little sliver of time that, that we had back here in the early early 80 period. And there wasn't anything recorded, was it? But between the years that he was about a teenager till he we know, we know was he was he? born. Yes. We know something when he was 12, he was and then when he was baptized. Yeah. That's and then for those three and a half years, and, then the, and that was at age thirty. Yeah, and then he preached. There was also yeah. yeah. Then there's plenty of information. Yeah, then. yeah. But yeah, not a whole lot of information about his childhood. So it sure seems a shame. I mean, because he's this, <laughs> he's the uh, how do you want to say the focal point. The focal of, point of uh, us becoming Christians. It was because of him coming and dying for us, mm -hmm. and uh, it seems it does seem kind of odd that God wouldn't allow more have been written. About there's all that. there's a lot written from when he started his preaching, but mm -hmm. before that, I mean, I, I look at that. There's a, a proverb that says, "Train up a child in the way he Think should go, and when right. he's old, he'll not depart from it." And so. I say, okay, Joseph and Mary, with God's guidance, must have really trained him they up. Must just have. To, I mean. Before 12, because he's in the temple right. at 12, 
you know, talking show somebody. talking to the, to the yeah. wise men. Yes. But, you know, he's he's showing his wisdom there from God. Yeah. So not a lot of information, but you know, God wanted it that way for a reason. Right. Exactly. Okay. So we've got Jesus preaching. The the Jewish leaders convince the Romans that they need to execute Jesus. So they 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 convince the leaders that they need to do it do that. But then three days later. After he dies by crucifixion, three days later, he rises from the dead. So, you know, and again, this is stories that, that everybody knows. But he does that, and this resurrection really is proclaimed as the basis for Christianity. And that resurrection, we're probably not sitting here right now. That's right. Yeah. So this is the, the basis of, of Christianity. But the Jews are divided. They, some say, no. Nope, some say yes. I mean, we know from history today that most of the Jews, by far the large majority of the Jews, don't accept Jesus as the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, way back then there was this, a division. Some followed him, some didn't. But it all started with the Jews. Remember, remember Jesus was a Jew, the Jewish preachers, I mean, the disciples. So this is, this is where it's, it's all starting from. So there's a very, very rapid spread of Christianity throughout the entire Roman Empire and beyond at this time. So again, we're looking before 70 AD, just incredible, incredible expansion. Um, during this time also, and I believe this is in your notebook on page, or page 14.12, there is a rebellion against Rome and persecution. There's, well, this is actually not quite there yet, so let me stop. There's this revolt against the Roman rule. There's the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. So the, the temple is destroyed. Remember the temple that had been rebuilt when Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah came back from their, their dispersion. They come back, they rebuild the temple, and here in 70 AD, the Romans destroyed the Jewish temple. Mm -hmm. And actually, there's there's the temple's demolished then, but then about what's that, 63 years later, there's another uprising, another revolt called the Bar Kokhba Revolt, which is under 12B in your notebook. It took two years to crush that revolt, and at that time, the Jews were expelled from the land, and that's when the land was named Palestine. So there's this, your, your history lesson for tonight. So now, from then until now, what's going on? You know, this is the first century, first, second century, this is all happening. <coughs> From then until the 20th century and on until today, we've got persecution. And it's, as it says on the slide, unrelenting persecution. It just keeps coming wave after wave after wave. But there's always in the nation of Israel, in the land of Israel, there's always this very small Jewish presence throughout the years. But the Jews spread throughout all the world. Throughout all the world, they're dispersed everywhere. But the amazing thing, in my mind, the amazing thing really is that just over that entire time, over those, call it 2,000 years, 1,900 years, they still remain as a separate people. Mm -hmm. A very distinct, separate people, in spite of the persecution, in spite of the, 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 the people wanting to exterminate them or assimilate them into their own cultures. Mm -hmm. They still remain a separate people, which really is a, is a pretty incredible incredible thing. Late in the 19th century, there is a support that starts. In a, or, Excuse me. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, go back to 12B. What is Bar... Bar Kokhba, he was yeah, a... Um, what is that? He I was a um, rabbi. The, he was a rabbi. He was oh, a Jewish... A man. Yeah, it's a man. He was a Jewish rabbi. Oh, he was a man. Yeah, that okay. tried to... And he had a group of people yes, with him? Yes, yeah. Trying oh, to lead okay. a revolt. Yeah. Good question. Thank yeah, you. I've, I've never no, that, seen that before. Yep, I yep. haven't either. Good question. Uh -huh. Good question. So he was just, he was a rabbi. A rabbi. Yep, okay. yep. He was a rabbi that had followers and tried to hmm. get everybody moving in the and same direction. he was direction. in Rome too? No, he was in, in Israel. Okay. He was in Israel. But the Romans are what he was trying to rise up against. And okay. And they crushed him. History right there? Yeah. You're a better historian than I am. <laughs> um, okay, so again, end of the 19th century, we start having this 
Zionism starts, you know, the support for a Jewish homeland back in the actual land of Israel. So this starts in the late 19th century. Um, the land, like I said earlier, is now called Palestine. And in the early 20th century, this movement starts gaining momentum. Um, then comes the Nazi Holocaust. Mm. And because of that, many more Jews start returning to the land. And we start getting a real <coughs> constant flow of Jews <coughs> back into the land. Yep. I got another question. That's fine. <coughs> uh, 13 C's, the Zionist movement, mm -hmm. is that the Palestine people? Those are Jews, yeah. Oh. Mount, Mount Zion is in Jerusalem. Right. So the movement is called the Zionist movement. Okay. People mm -hmm. wanting to go back to the land of Israel, land of okay. Palestine at that time. So that's what the Zionist movement is. When and did Palestine become part of and all this look back, fighting here? Look back on, uh, where was it? Where it was the Bar Kokhba, 12B, Bar Kokhba Revolt, Jews expelled from the land, land renamed Palestine. Oh, okay. So that's yeah, way back in the second century is when okay. the land was named Palestine. So where did the name Palestine come from? I don't know that. It, it came, um, what, what uh, the Emperor Hadrian um, <clears throat> wanted to exterminate the Jews, mm -hmm. uh, so he made it illegal for them to be in their land. That didn't stick for very long. Um, but he wanted to expunge the name even. So he renamed the land. So it had the name Judea and Galilee and whatever. He renamed it Syria Palestina, which comes from Syria to the northeast, Philistia to the southwest. So it was Syria Palestina. So that so the word Palestine is derived from the word Philistine. Um, so that those people from the Old Testament. So that's where the word comes from. Of course, the modern-day Palestinians are not ethnically Philistines. They just they have the name. Oh. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's actually a, a a mixed, you know, ethnically mixed people, much like Americans. <laughs> we're we're pretty ethnically mixed. Well, the Palestinians are too, and of course they're uh, they are Arab and they're Muslim, not Jewish, either ethnically or religiously. Mm -hmm. uh, but their the name comes from the land. The name of the land comes from the Emperor Hadrian, the Roman Emperor Hadrian. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. I sort of knew that, but it wasn't coming out <laughs> very easily. Okay, so we've got the Nazi Holocaust, many people returning, many Jews returning to the land, and then in 1948, Israel actually becomes an independent nation again after 1900 years. What was it yesterday? It was the 65th anniversary of. Mm -hmm. They are a day or two ago. Yeah, yeah a couple of days ago. So, so 1948, 65 years ago, that's what's happening. That's, if you saw something in the news, this is what it's about. Yeah. Um, so, 1948. Then we've got all sorts of wars with the Arab neighbors. And these are still continuing. But in 1967, there was what's called the Six Day War. And that's when Israel once again controlled Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. Um, and then now, today, I mean, throughout this whole time, we've got ongoing tension, ongoing conflict. I mean, it's just, it's constant, and it's, it's never-ending. I was over there, what, five years ago, four years ago, something like that, I guess five or six years ago, and we were in northern Israel, and Hezbollah in Lebanon started shooting, shooting, lobbing bombs or whatever they did, and you could actually hear the incoming whistle, and it was a little frightening, but... We got back down to Tiberias, and they're all like, oh, yeah, it happens all the time. So, <laughs> no. So, but it is. It's just ongoing. So people, unfortunately, get callous to it and get used to it. But, uh, I was there, and I saw it, and I thought, okay, I don't, don't like this. I think it'll be that way until the return of Christ. Yep. Well, actually, let's look at that. So we've got, that's, that's a good segue there. We've got the future. We've got the last days. It's talked about throughout Scripture. It talks about the last days, and there's going to be trouble in the world, and especially trouble for Israel. Israel is going to be invaded, according to prophecy and scriptural prophecy. Israel is going to be invaded and conquered. And like you said, Geneva, Jesus returns as Messiah. Finally, it's going to be recognized by just a remnant of the Jews, not all of them. Jesus is going to deliver Israel, raise the dead, judge other those who are judged righteous or unrighteous, 
and establish the kingdom of God throughout the earth. So that's the end of the history lesson. That's it wasn't 90 seconds. <laughs> But I think you... It was only the Old Testament part you had to do. Oh, okay, okay. I think you've got to, hopefully, you have a little bit better feel for the history. And you've got your notebook, which right. I think is really valuable to go back and say, okay, I don't so understand. So we are in the last days, aren't we? I believe absolutely I believe we are. in the last days. And, you know, the, the 1948 with Israel coming back into the land, yes. lots of prophecies oh, about that. Oh, yes. And that's, I believe, the biggest... Um, biggest sign that we are in the last days. Mm -hmm. Now, how long do those last days last? Yeah. Who knows? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. It says in Scripture. I don't Nobody think God knows. intends for us to know. No. Okay, I'm going to turn it back over to Paul. We'll do section 3 tonight. Okay, so the, the stuff that Ray just covered in half an hour, you know, something like that, yeah. is pretty concentrated, right? Yeah. But it can be very helpful to have the big picture overview and then kind of zoom in. Mm -hmm. So the first zoom in is right now. Okay. Okay, so Ray covered from here, and actually we backed up a little bit into Genesis, right? So, so this is a little bit more detailed timeline than the one that you've got in your notebook. So we covered from here, over here. Off, off the chart, <laughs> onto the end. So this, you know, he covered all of Jewish history, uh, you know, for all of that. So now this zoom in, which this is our next segment of the books of the Bible, right? We're going to cover uh, from Job down through Psalms. And so we're going to start at the same point Ray did. And we're going to cover through um, part of the United Kingdom, okay? Right down to here. So we're going to cover <coughs> roughly, not quite, a thousand years of Old Testament history in, in the segment we're about to, you know. So this is going to be a zoom in. We're going to take it apart a little bit and look at it in a little bit more detail. And we'll keep doing that as we go through, right? So we'll have a zoom in next time on from the, the uh, uh, divided kingdom on into the, you know, the time of the prophets and, you know, that kind of stuff. So, okay, so, so that's where we're going. We are on page 15, um, it is where it starts in the next uh, chunk of the, of the uh, books of the Bible. So Ray mentioned last time we finished up with uh, the Israel, they're not called Jews yet, uh, the Hebrews, they are called, uh, the Hebrews are in Egypt, they're a small family. Ray mentioned that we've got actually three different periods of 400 years. So we've, Grace mentioned a couple of them tonight. So the first one is this period where they're in Egypt. We have zip information about what goes on during that time. Hmm. It, there's, there's almost nothing. Um, so the, the, our next information shows up with Exodus. And then now they're, they're very numerous. Uh, a lot of people. So the next um, book of the Bible that is, uh, after Genesis is Exodus, but it's not the next one we're going to look at. Um, we, uh, when we introduced um, the structure of the Bible last week, we mentioned that when we go through the Old Testament, we're going to do it chronologically uh, so that you can kind of fit it to the structure of the history that, that um, Ray just uh, summarized. Um, so most scholars um, agree that the book of Job is the, actually the next one uh, to be considered, and so we're going to start with that. Um, so on page 15, you've got, uh, starting with the book of Job, and, and you can see the format there is what all the rest of the books of the Bible, uh, what we will do. You know, who wrote it? When was it written? Sometimes we aren't very sure <laughs> when it was written. Sometimes we're not even real sure exactly who wrote it. But um, we have more information on the who than we do on the when sometimes. Um, and, and a little a short summary, and then there's an outline of, of the book. So we're going to do that for every book of the Bible. We are not going to read those pages to you. <laughs> they are there for, uh, for reference for you. What we're going to do is highlight just a a few things out of each of the books, we will touch on every one of the books, 
Um, but we're just going to do highlights, and then if you want to dig in a little bit more, you've got uh, these things, and of course, if you want to go further, there's reference works uh, that are available. Okay, so starting with Job. Uh, Job is written as poetry, most of it, not quite every scrap of it, but most of it is poetry. It is, therefore, the first book in the poetry section of the Old Testament. Uh, we talked last week about how the uh, the Bible is organized by type of literature. So you got law, then you've got history, then you've got poetry, then you've got prophecy. Um, so the first book of poetry is Job, but where it fits is probably during that time that um, Israel's in Egypt. Um, but actually, although it's poetry, it's written as a play. It's a drama, okay? So you've got, it, it, it follows Hebrew poetic structure, but it's, it's um, dialogue, right? Yeah. And recorded, and it's been performed a lot of times as either uh, reading it as a play or even acting it out. Larry? It, it reminds me of the dialogues of Plato. Yes. Which it, were right. plays, it's, but they had big philosophical conversations. Exactly, exactly. It's much more that type of literature than, it, yeah. than, than our type of play, or, yeah. Uh, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so at the beginning of the book, uh, Job is declared by God to be completely upright. And then he loses everything, including his health. And um, the book then explores the ancient question, why do bad things happen to good people? So, you know, this question we has... We still ask that today. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so I think it's very interesting that this is very possibly the oldest book of the Bible. It was probably written down before Moses wrote down Genesis, even though the events of Genesis had happened <laughs> earlier. Um, Joe, you know, the very first thing that God inspires someone to write down was pro very pro probably the book of Job. So why do bad things happen to good people? Well, in the end of the book, uh, Job's friends, who come supposedly to sympathize with him but end up accusing him, uh, the friends are rebuked for misstating how God handles this kind of situation. They claim that Job must be a tremendous sinner because he had tremendous suffering. And God says at the end, you don't know me at all. Job's the one who knows me. And Job himself finds that he has grown, he has learned uh, from this experience. And so, you know, we don't have any kind of a summary at the end that says, and that's why bad things happen to good people. You have to read it and digest it. It's not all just laying there on the surface. Well, then we do have Exodus. Uh, um, we talked about how God chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, Ray has sum summarized that. Uh, they have become a large group of people now. Uh, in Egypt, and uh, the name Exodus means departure, and it refers to the departure of Israel from Egypt. So the basic facts about um, what goes on in Exodus, uh, Moses is designated the, at the beginning of the book uh, by God to be the one to lead his people out of Egypt and into the land that he had promised to them. Uh, the Egyptian king, Pharaoh, has other ideas. He refuses to let them go. And as a result, God sends ten plagues on Egypt until they, he finally does let them go, and, and uh, the rest of Egypt lets them go. The final plague is called the Passover. Uh, that's probably a familiar uh, term to you. Um, the Israelites miraculously are unable to cross the Red Sea and escape from Egypt, and God brings them to Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, uh, there's a system of worship established uh, that we call today the Law of Moses. Um, the, it's, I think it's worth pointing out, this isn't in Exodus itself, but I think it's worth pointing out that in the New Testament, um, these events are treated as literal. So these are not treated as um, merely allegories. But they are treated as allegories. So they're treated as literal history that also had an allegorical meaning. And uh, 
these events, actually the, the exodus from Egypt pops up over and over and over again through the Old Testament and on into the New Testament. This was the designation of this people as God's nation. And it becomes a big, uh, you know, a big event that keeps being referred to. So the figurative meaning of this whole thing, Egypt is said to represent sin, which enslaves all men and women. And um, Israel is God's people uh, from whatever nation. Uh, Moses is a figure of Jesus Christ, uh, and he leads people out of sin. Uh, the Passover is uh, specifically, we're told, uh, is e equal to the sacrifice or, the, you know, the allegory of the sacrifice of Jesus. And crossing the Red Sea is the allegory of baptism. So, you know, all of these uh, facts out of the Exodus have allegorical meaning, and the New Testament <laughs> uh, points out what those meanings are. Um, another fact is that Israel was repeatedly faithless, repeatedly rebellious uh, during the time in the wilderness. And this also is part of the figurative meaning, and the New Testament picks up on that and um, urges us <laughs> to take the lesson, uh, to not do what Israel did. It uses the word type, and I'm going to refer you to the glossary. Now, you don't have to turn to that, but you, I think you're aware that in the, in the appendices in the back of the notebook there's a glossary and the word type is defined in there and, and many of the terms that we use in, the, in this class you'll find defined there um, but um, Jesus it, or Moses is a type of Christ uh, Israel is a type of the Christian believer so it, it's an allegorical um, prefiguring excuse me I'm sorry I'm sorry I think we have a smoke alarm that's about to die. It keeps beeping out here, so just okay. Okay. ignore the beep. And it, it's not ours, because ours is here. <laughs> okay, well, so it's, it must be under one of the neighboring um, spaces. I think it's my cell phone. Oh, maybe it's your cell phone dying. Yeah. Like, <laughs> okay. Well, at least we know what it is. Then. Okay. So <laughs> there's a camera. So we don't we don't need to uh, to panic. It, it, high pitch okay. things I can't even hear. So. <laughs> If you ever do it, I, although I, I know I hear that thing because it's really loud. How do you pronounce this word? P E N T A T E U C H. Penta. Pentateuch. Oh, Pentateuch. Sorry. Pentateuch. Pentateuch. I heard that. That's, another, that's another word. Penta meaning five. So it's the five books of Moses. So the, the five books of Moses are called the Pentateuch. Um, that's so Genesis, this, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So took is what? What's that mean then? Five book? Does it mean books? You know, Pentateuch? I would have to look that up. Maybe it's in the glossary. Let's look. I think it is. Five <laughs> teachings. It probably Pentateuch. just says the five books of Moses. It's not even in here. <laughs> the, the, the glossary... Let me just issue this caveat right now. It's actually in bold type at the beginning of the glossary. It is not exhaustive. It is not. <laughs> it does not have every Bible-related word that you might find. So. Um, so your assignment, Geneva, for next week is to bring back the meaning of the word Pentateuch. I know the Penta part, but I don't. I, it must be something like book or writing or something like that. If I read it. Um, Next three books are Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I've got them all on one slide here, um, just because we're not going to say a, a great deal about um, these three books. They give a bunch more information about the law, so they're all part of the law. Leviticus, specifically, has a lot of information about the sacrifices and about the worship, um, the festivals and, and worship services, and about the the uh, priests and their work, and about cleanness, ritual cleanness and, and being un, what makes you unclean. So that's kind of what the content of Leviticus is. Um, numbers then records, the reason for the name, Numbers, is that it records two censuses of the nation of Israel, once when, right when they leave Egypt and once right before they go into the Promised Land. 
in between those two events, there is a record in numbers of some very dramatic confrontations. Um, showdowns between Moses and Aaron and the people. Um, they are continually rebellious, and a lot of those rebellions are recorded in uh, the numbers. Uh, the biggest one, or you know, the one that maybe gets the most attention, is how uh, Israel came to the border of the land, God said, you can go on in, and they rebelled. Right there on the border of the land, they said, we can't do it, we can't do it. And they wouldn't go in, and so God said, all right, if you don't want to, back to the wilderness, 40 years, 38 more at, by, at this point, 38 more years until this whole generation that rebelled dies out, and then your children will come in. So that's, that's in, you know, that whole showdown is in, is in numbers. Deuteronomy, then, is a series of speeches um, given by Moses at the very end of his life and right before Israel enters the land. Um, so he gives these speeches and recaps the law. So lots of the material that is in the earlier books of the law is uh, restated, uh, organized in a little bit better um, in the Deuteronomy because the, the law in Exodus... Um, was the first revelation. Leviticus records the, and Numbers also records some kind of progressive additions on. Moses pulls it all together in Deuteronomy. Oh, uh, for in Deuteronomy, should we bring up Lucas? No. Okay. Um, there's also, besides the recap of the law, Deuteronomy has a very key prophecy near the end. Uh, Moses gives a, an outline of the history of Israel in advance. So that material that Ray took us through, Moses took Israel through before it happened in, in summary form. So it, it's, a, it's a key prophecy. Um, then at the end of Deuteronomy, Moses dies and Joshua uh, is the designated successor. He's appointed by God to be the leader that brings um, the Israel into the land, helps them cross the Jordan. And uh, we pointed out that, th that Jesus is named after him. It's Yahshua. God, Yah saves is the name. The Greek form of Yahshua is Jesus. The English form of Jesus is Jesus. Okay, so <laughs> if you, you've got... You, you, you've, you've, transported the name across three languages now, so that's why it doesn't sound the same anymore. So are you saying Jesus and Joshua had the same name? Yes. Just like Joseph, I mean, uh, the, the husband of Mary, had the, the same name as Joseph in the Old Testament, right? To the people in Israel at the time, he had the same name as Joshua? Yes. But they were different languages, weren't they? Right. So um, Jesus is an English corruption of the Greek corruption of the Hebrew corruption. <laughs> that was the, the original name. So but that's true. Almost all of the Jewish New Testament figures, which is most of them uh, are Jewish, uh, have Old Testament names. So, right? what did, what so is Simon the, is Simeon. What did the people in Israel call Jesus. Yeshua? If in Hebrew, they would call him Yeshua. Yeah. Yeshua. Mm -hmm. Just but, like they... But not they, ya, Joshua. Not Yeshua. Right. Yeah, well, right, it's the, the, the modern Hebrew form is Yeshua instead of Yahshua. Oh. But it's, you know, that's just language changes over time and vowels really can change. Well, there was a difference so. in pronunciation between... Joshua's time and Jesus' time. Right. And I don't know that anybody could say definitively exactly how they pronounced anything in Joshua's time. Plus, this, they, they you know, spoke this removes of history. So. Common language was Aramaic, except in worship or something, right? Right, right. So, in, you know, in Aramaic, they would have said Yeshua or something very yeah. similar um, in Jesus' time. So Joshua, or you know, which isn't right either. That's the English corruption of the Hebrew. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, Joshua, the man we know as Joshua, led um, Israel in, uh, led them across the Jordan River, led them in conquering 
the, the people. And this conquest is one of the examples of the severity of God that we looked at earlier. Because way back in Abraham's time, 400 years earlier, God had said he was going to bring the people, he was going to give this land to Abraham's offspring, but not yet. Because the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. God gave the people who were living in the land four centuries to shape up. That's the mercy part of God. The long suffering. He gives people a lot of time to reform. But they what didn't. Did they refused. And so the severity part had to come into play. And so Israel became the instrument by which God executed his judgment on those people who had refused for many, many, many generations to, uh, to reform. And so God says, all right, your time's up. And, and now it's time for my people to have this land. Um, and so they were given the job of conquering. Do you have a quick question, Larry? I, I don't know if there's a quick answer. It's, uh, Maybe we should talk later because we're 10 yeah. minutes from the end here and we've got another section that Ray has to do when we're done here. Um, fortunately, it's going to be short. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, God does what he said he would do at the very end of Joshua. But, but, you know, the people didn't do, once again, they didn't do what God told them to do. They didn't clear the people out of the land. And so Joshua, at the end of his life, he's a very old man, and he throws down this challenge and he says, choose who you're going to serve. If it's the Lord, serve him. If it's these other gods, serve them. And then there's that famous quote, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's been on a plaque in our house, I know, and, and you know, probably some others. Um, what comes next is the period of the judges. And uh, Ray mentioned that the judges and Ruth fit into this period. Um, God considered himself to be the king of Israel. He says that uh, flat out. Um, he appointed judges to administer the law. The period uh, of time, this is another one of those 400-year periods now, uh, the, the period of the judges. And the pattern of this period is sometimes called the four S's. So they would sin. They would, they would go into idolatry. And then God would hand them over to their enemies. And that would be the period of subjugation. So they would be uh, subjugated by their enemies. Then would come the supplication. They would uh, repent and beg God for help, and then would be the salvation. He would send a judge to deliver them, and they'd be okay for a while. During the lifetime of the judge, they would do all right, and then the judge would die, and it would start all over again. They would go right back the way they were. Uh, during this abysmal spiritual time, there were some notable exceptions. And one of those is recorded in the story of Ruth. It's set during this time, a uh, time of great faithlessness. But here we have a story of a faithful family, one of the faithful families in the nation. And it's a, it's a very lovely love story. Um, and it also is the setup for the arrival of David. He comes along in the next uh, pair of books, which is First and Second Samuel. So the final judge... Uh, of the time of the judges was the prophet Samuel. Uh, he, he gives his name to these books, First and Second Samuel. Um, the people rejected Samuel's leadership and they rejected God as being their king and they demanded a human king. Uh, God was not pleased, but he gave them what they asked for. So they asked for a, a king like the nations. He gave them a king like the nations, a not very righteous man. Uh, that was Saul. Um, he proved to be just as faithless as Israel had been. He did unify the nation, though. They had been a collection of just kind of loose tribes. He did unify the nation. But God removed Saul because uh, of his lack of faith, and he chose David and called him a man after my own heart. And so God sent Samuel to anoint David, that is, to pour oil over his head, uh, to anoint him with oil, designating him as the king, even though it would be years before David would take the throne. Um, well, David was very faithful uh, 
to God. He was certainly not perfect. Uh, but just as, as God had uh, chosen Abraham for his great faith, he also chose David. He promised to Abraham uh, a seed, an offspring. He promised to David a seed, an offspring. Uh, the offspring of David was, going, was promised an eternal kingdom. And uh, uh, David was promised that kingdom as well, and the offspring would live forever and would reign forever on the throne of David. We're going to have more about all of that the week after next. We're actually going to spend a whole segment talking about that. Um, in the New Testament, then, these promises, to both to Abraham and to David, are applied to Jesus. Jesus is called this the seed or offspring that was promised. Um, so this is a significant foreshadowing that we see in the life of David. And David is, once again, a type of Christ, a foreshadowing of the work of Christ. Um, as you may or may not know, the word Messiah, which is the Hebrew word, means anointed. It's referring to that anointing as king. The word Christ is the Greek word that means anointed. It's the same, once again, we've got these three language things, right? So the English word is anointed, the Hebrew word is Messiah, um, roughly. That's the way we pronounce it in English. And roughly, the Greek word is, is uh, Christ. Uh, they mean the same thing. So Jesus was also anointed long before he was permitted to take the throne. So once again, we see this foreshadowing. Well, David did take his throne. He ruled righteously for 40 years. However, he did fail to do right regarding Bathsheba. He committed adultery with her, and then he had her husband killed. Um, he was confronted by God's prophet Nathan, and he was devastated by guilt. But God forgave him. And this is a huge example from the Old Testament of how the, the doctrine of forgiveness, of God being a very forgiving God, is not a New Testament teaching alone. It is uh, all over the Old Testament as well, and this is one of the areas that we're going to spend one of our whole uh, Great Themes segment talking about. David wrote many, certainly not all, of the Psalms. Um, the Psalms are poems. So the Book of Psalms is the second book of poetry uh, in, the, in the poetry section of the Old Testament. Um, many of them were written by David, um, so you know you could say that a lot of the Psalms fit into this period that's covered by First and Second Samuel. Not all of it. Some of the Psalms were written later because there were a number of other writers also uh, that contributed to the Psalms. So they're poems. Uh, they are songs, songs for worship and prayers. Uh, there is. There are songs of comfort and songs of praise and rejoicing, and there are um, cries of anguish and cries for help. Um, Psalms is by far the most emotional of the books of the Bible. Um, huge, uh, the, I, I can't take your question, Larry. We've got to finish, so we're gonna have to do it later. Sorry. Um, the other, big thing that's in the Psalms is some key prophecies of Jesus. Okay, so the Psalms are quoted very extensively in the New Testament as being prophetic of the work of Messiah. And uh, so lots of prophecies there. So as you read, as you are reading um, the Psalms, think about not just the surface meaning of what it might have meant to David, but also what would this have meant to Jesus? What did Jesus learn when he read the Psalms about his own work and about ourselves? Because there's, you know, all of those cries for help and the comfort and the rejoicing, they're all expressions that we can, that resonate with us as well. So kind of three things to watch for as you read the Psalms. Well, 2 Samuel closes with David as an old man. His son Solomon is about to take the throne, and we're going to pick up there next week. Um, there are reasons to pay attention to this section. So Ray asked the question, why pay attention to Jewish history? Well, the, the reason we've seen some of the reasons for this section, there are many, many types and allegories, things that point forward to the work of Jesus, things that point forward to the Christian. Um, there are lots of 
incidents and lots of people held up as examples for us, either to follow or to avoid. Um, the, lots of this is told as stories, right? These are stories about people, true stories of real people. Stories resonate with human beings. We remember stories. We empathize with the people in stories, right? So there's, there's a reason for this, and God is communicating his lessons to mankind through these stories. So there's a lot here for us. Uh, it's just not all dead ancient history. All right, with that, I have left Ray two minutes and 15 seconds, <laughs> maybe by the time. We are in the home stretch, and we are going to spread to the end. So that's where we are right now. So we're talking about reading tips. This is section nine, reading tips. And the thing is, the, 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 what we're going to talk about is why is the Bible challenging? We're on page 22 in your notebook, so you can see where we are. But really, there's, there's a lot of factors as to why the Bible can be challenging. They're listed up here. A lot of the Bible stories, a lot of Bible references are allegorical stories. They're symbolic prophecies. There's just a huge amount of information in the Bible. And the subjects that are dealt with are some of the deepest, deepest subjects that are out there. So that's what makes the Bible challenging. There's just a lot of information in there, and it's the way it's presented. It's not really realistic to think that we can digest all of this in a short time. It's not just a quick read and say, okay, I've done it, I've got it. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, it is difficult to read. I, in my notes, I've got a little, let me read this phrase. If you find the Bible is difficult to read, it's probably because it's difficult to read. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not rocket science. It is just a difficult book to read. It's long. You know, it's not only long, but it's also, it's a lot of different books. It's a mini library. You know, there's 66 books. So, and we talked about it last week, the different authors from the different backgrounds and so forth, different writing styles. So there's just a lot of information there, a lot of different types of literature. But again, it's dealing with very, very important information. So once we accept the fact that it is going to take some work, it's going to take some effort, then we say, okay, now it's a challenge and it's not a frustration. It's a challenge. I'm a marathon runner. I take the marathon as a challenge. Toward the end, I get a little frustrated with my body. My legs just, I say, come on, work. <laughs> but, you know, during, during your reading the Bible, just say, it's a challenge, and I'm just going to stick with it. My, my marathon, you know, is left foot, right foot, repeat. You know, just over and over. And sometimes when I read the Bible, it's just like, okay, let's read the chapter, study it, and then let's read the next one, and read the next one, and read the next one, and just keep going. Um, if... Uh, if we have sort of a, a childlike patience, reading the Bible and read it slowly and understand, we will begin to absorb it slowly. It takes time. It's like a lot of people say the Bible's like an onion. You know, just one layer at a time. And a lifetime of layers are there for us. You know, the Bible tells, it, tells us itself that it's not a piece of cake.